Now, we were just talking with Alex about the, uh, I guess you could call it the PSYOP operation that's going on here, this uh, military drill where they're flying a giant, larger than a commercial airliner, this giant plane, a Boeing E-4B, through the building skyscrapers downtown Austin, circling around at very, very low, very dangerous levels. And uh, we're also talking about the NSA, of course. That's been a topic for quite some time. We have a new sponsor, PrivateInternetAccess.com. You know, you hear stories every day about the NSA spying on U.S. citizens. This is a way to keep your information private. It will encrypt your Internet connection. It'll hide your IP address so you can browse anything anonymously. It offers firewall protection to prevent data mining. And it eliminates records of your computer activity. That's PrivateInternetAccess.com, an American company. So check that out. That's a sponsor of ours that helps us support the operation. Now, we have on the phone with us Dr. Edwin Vieira. Now, he has four degrees from Harvard. He has 36 years of practicing law, specializing in constitutional law. He has argued before the Supreme Court. And, of course, he is an author. And his most recent book is Sover The Sword and Sovereignty. It's about the right to keep and bear arms, but he has a little bit different take on it. He focuses more on the militia as opposed to an individual right to keep and bear arms. So we're going to talk to him about that. Very interested to hear his comments on that and also about his participation in, a, in an upcoming documentary called Mulan Labe, which is, of course, the Greek for come and take it. It's what the uh, Spartans told the, uh, the Persians when they said to disarm. And he's doing that with, uh, in conjunction with James Yeager. And I believe, uh, Dr. Vieira, you're, you're one of the associate producers on that. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. Okay, super. Now, you know, we, we hear people talking about the Second Amendment. People have defended it on pragmatic means, talking about, you know, we have a right to collect these things. We like to keep them like we like to keep cars. Or they talk about the fact that they would like to do sporting events, target shooting, hunting with it. Or they talk about the fact that they have a right to protect themselves from burglars or anybody who might attack them. But we realize that there's really a strategic importance for the Second Amendment, and that is to protect us from a tyrannical government. And Dr. Vieira has a different take on that, saying that this is essentially a collective right. Is that correct, Dr. Vieira? Well, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't put it in exactly those terms. Right. I think the collective right versus individual right debate uh, really muddies the waters. Mm -hmm. If you look at the first 13 words, of the Second Amendment. And let's remember that there's nothing in the Constitution that's an irrelevant. There's nothing there that is uh, surplusage, as it were, that it wasn't put in for a particular uh, purpose. A well-regulated militia being necessary to secure the free state. And what that tells you is the ultimate goal, actually, of the entire constitutional system, a free state. Mm -hmm. And obviously, a free state can't exist without some significant measure of security. And then the thing that the Constitution describes as necessary to this security and ultimately necessary for this purpose of this uh, free state is a well-regulated militia. Now, that's the only place in which the Constitution describes anything as necessary for any purpose. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say Congress is necessary. It doesn't say the president is necessary. It doesn't say the Supreme Court is necessary. Obviously, the Constitution could have been written in a different manner with different forms of government structures. It doesn't even say the states are necessary. The states are essentially contingent entities that derive from the colonies, which were more or less grants given by the king and queen of England. Uh, there's nothing necessary there in a political, uh, philosophical sense. But a well-regulated militia is necessary. And then if you go to the rest of the Second Amendment, it tells you the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, the right of the people to keep and bear arms is, of course, the essence of a well-regulated militia. That's almost the definition mm -hmm. of a well-regulated militia, the people in arms. And, of course, it shall not be infringed, because otherwise you couldn't possibly have a free state. Right. So what we're talking about here is a right that is looking to a collective or political purpose, a free state. It obviously has to be exercised by individuals. There is no collective exercise of this right. Right, right. Every and I didn't, I didn't mean to imply to that it wasn't. Action. That's right. I didn't mean to imply that it wasn't an individual right. Certainly right. it is, just like all the Bill of Rights. It was really more of what you're talking about is really how for it to be practically and effective is that people, it needs to be organized. Is that correct? Well, that's exactly right. If, mm -hmm. if you look at the various uh, reasons that are given by most of the proponents of Americans' right to keep their arms, and you mentioned some of them, target shooting, hunting, self-defense. Well, all of those would be elements of uh, activities that people would engage in for preparing themselves for the militia or through the militia. Obviously, target shooting and hunting prepares you for the use of arms. And uh, self-defense is not only an individual concept, 
concept, but it's a, it's a collective or community concept. All right? mm-hmm. But the essence of the problem here is not having that gun in your cellar, having your M16, if you could get one, I guess AR-15, and a 1,000 rounds of ammunition in your cellar as an individual. That is not going to enable you to stand up to an organized tyranny. That's right. That's obvious, right? That's right. It's like like... organization with other members of the community in some sort of structure that has prepared you through training and a certain amount of discipline and so forth and so on to deal with that kind of a problem. Exactly. It's what Franklin said when he said we'll either hang together or we'll hang separately. If we are all just a bunch of disjointed individuals, it's not going to be possible for us to exercise our individual right against an organized tyranny. If your individual right under the Second Amendment really uh, flows into an individual duty Mm -hmm. to provide yourself as one member of the militia, if you look back historically, and this is the only way you can discover what the words well-regulated militia, or if you go to the original Constitution, the militia of the several states, so it's actually, the concept is actually an original Constitution. The the Second Amendment is is, is essentially a re-emphasis of that. But the Constitution doesn't define those terms. Mm-hmm. For the obvious reason, the Constitution is not a dictionary. Right. Most of the terms in the Constitution are not defined. Because it defines Congress, the House, and the Senate. Those were new bodies that were created. Uh, and it defines, for instance, the word treason because the framers wanted to cut down the old English definition of treason and make it very, very specific. But it doesn't define any of these terms related to the militia. And the reason was because every person in the United States, at least who was an adult, knew perfectly well what a well-regulated militia was. Every adult free American, because of course there were slaves at that time, but every adult free American either was participating in a militia at that point in time, or he had been participating in a militia for a great number of years during his lifetime. And this had gone back into the early 1600s. And if one digs out, as I have done, and, and put a couple of examples, uh, two colonies, actually Rhode Island and Virginia, in the sword and sovereignty. If one goes back to these colonial records, one will discover dozens and dozens of militia acts, militia statutes that were passed in the various colonies and the independent states after 1776. And they're all essentially the same in terms of the structure, the duties, the power, so forth and so on, of these uh, militias. And in fact, if you lay them down on a table and you kind of excise the the title, so you couldn't see from which state they came, which colony they came. You'd mm-hmm. be rather hard pressed to tell uh, from which one a particular statute came. And if you look at that structure, you can come up with a definition of a well regulated militia. And the essence of a well regulated militia was that the people were going to be armed. In fact, every adult, able bodied, free man within the colonies of states had an obligation. To be armed, not simply a right. Of course, the right flowed from the obligation, right? You couldn't right. be obliged to do something if you didn't have a right to do it. But you were obliged to have a gun, mm-hmm. usually your own gun, which you had to go out to the free market to purchase. And you were required to keep this where? Not in some arsenal or magazine controlled by public official, but in your own home. Very much like what we see in, in modern-day Switzerland, isn't it? Well, the Swiss militia structure goes actually way back into the, into the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, the English had a militia structure based on what they call the yeomanry, and that basic idea uh, came to uh, America. Uh, the, the beauty of what happened in America was you didn't have the hierarchical social structure of lords and commons. And as a result, from the very beginning, everyone had to be organized in the militia. You didn't have distinctions based on these essentially fictional social classes. So the militia became, from the start, a highly democratic institution in the sense that everyone participated in it. Unless you were a conscientious objector, and then, of course, that you weren't required to have a firearm, but you could be required to do something else. I remember uh, we went to uh, England, we went to Warwick Castle, and they had a demonstration there. And the fellow who was uh, doing the archery who talked about the yeomanry there, and he talked about how they were required to practice. They were required to be experts at the longbow. And he said you, they practiced so much that you could even see the differences in their arms. On The, the one arm that took most of the pressure was, uh, you, you can go back and look at the skeletons and you can see a difference in that arm because these guys practiced so much with their longbow because that was part of their requirement as a yeomanry. Right, that, that was the, the bowman. Mm-hmm. And otherwise people were required to keep uh, arms of various kinds you know, in, in their homes so they could have drawn them immediately. Mm-hmm. So that, 
that concept goes back a long way. Now, what we've lost here in this country is the structure. If you look at the breakdown of the system, it really occurred at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s, uh, and eventually begins to be codified in what was called the Dick Act in 1903, uh, out of which a series of other acts, 1914, 1916, 1933, comes eventually the National Guard. And a lot of people look at the National Guard and they say, well, the National Guard is the continuation of the militia. And that's simply not true. If Mm -hmm. if you look at all the elements of the National Guard, it's a voluntary organization. The militia were not voluntary organization. Militia is a a draft organization. Uh, The National Guard people do not acquire their own arms and keep them at home. They're supplied arms supplied to them by the state government or the federal government. They keep them in some arsenal. Somewhere. And that's, that's a key point, too. Hang on. We're going to continue this discussion right after the break. We're talking to Dr. Edwin Vieira about the true nature of the militia, the true constitutional nature of the militia. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the InfoWars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happened. So check it out, InfoWars.com forward slash show. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Dr. Edwin Vieira about the militia and how he's helping us to understand the importance of the militia and to understand a correct definition of it. Before we get back to Dr. Vieira, we've had a couple of emails come in about this uh, E-4B that uh, has been flying around uh, Austin. One person writes from New Orleans. This is from Amanda. She said, this happened here also in Gretna about five minutes from downtown New Orleans about five months ago. A large, and she emphasizes large, white plane with no windows. That's also the way this is flying really low in a circle about four times. If it was any closer to the Superdome, it would have hit it. I couldn't get a picture due to this no space on my phone. I looked all over the web to find out if anyone was reporting this. Didn't see anything. She says, I understand your fear, Alex, because I was scared also. We also have a report from Las Vegas. This is from Mark. He says, last October, I had a similar experience to Alex's with a plane downtown in Las Vegas. I'm a cab driver in Las Vegas. I've seen countless thousands of planes come in and out of the airport or overshoot when the runway is too crowded. The plane I saw flew over the airport, but not in a standard flight lane. It flew over the airport, but west of the standard flight lanes over a private air terminal at a very low altitude. Very low, he emphasizes. This one, however, sprayed the ground, with which were presumably chemtrail agents. I don't know the model of the plane. It happened so fast and unexpectedly, but it was a huge white plane. So we'll see if there's any other reports about what's going on here in Austin, but we do have video of that. And Paul Joseph Watson is putting out an article about that right now, comparing pictures of what we took to actual photographs of uh, E-4B, as well as uh, some CNN reports about that. But we were talking to Dr. Edwin Vieira about the constitutional militia and distinctions about that. And as we were finishing up in the, uh, as we went to commercial break, Dr. Vieira, you were talking about the difference between the National Guard and the militia. One of the things that you made a distinction about was the fact that a militia keeps its arms at home. And the tradition of the English yeomanry, also as we see happening in Switzerland, and that doesn't happen with the National Guard. No, and of course the National Guard can be called out for functions other than the three limited functions that the Constitution assigns to the militia. And when the national, including being sent overseas, of course, to foreign wars or other Mm -hmm. kinds of military adventures. And when the National Guard is so called federalized, uh, it comes under the uh, control of the president and can be brought under the control of the regular armed forces, which, of course, is an impossibility for the militia because the militia and the regular armed forces are entirely separate, independent entities under the Constitution. And that's something that, excuse me, that, that's something people can, can help. To, it's, it's been out of our, we, we've lost that tradition. We've lost that understanding here in America for so long. But you can go back and you can look at something like uh, Last of the Mohicans, for example. Even if you don't want to go back to the original uh, history documents, you can see in the recorded history of the Revolutionary War, as well as in novels that were written about that time, you know, just prior to the Revolutionary War, like Last of the Mohicans, you see this tension 
between the regular army and the militia. The militia acted somewhat independent. They would cooperate with the regular army, but it was still a very separate independent entity. Well, it's just, they're separate entities. There are actually 50 of them. There's one in each state. They call the militia of the several states in the Constitution. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so that distinction still exists in the Constitution. This isn't simply a matter of history or tradition, something lost in the midst of time. This is a constitutional mandate. The difficulty is that Congress essentially uh, uh, flubbed the whole process, of giving them the benefit of the doubt on this, that what they were doing had some good intentions behind it. They created the National Guard to create a huge reserve force for the regular armed forces, and then they left everyone else in what they call the unorganized militia. So if you look at the militia statute of Congress today, uh, Title 10 of the United States Code, Section 331, it breaks these, what it calls the militia of the United States. And we could stop there. There's no such thing as the militia of the United States. Read the Constitution, apparently. They don't want right. it. But it, it calls this militia of the, of the United States being composed of two parts. The organized militia, which is the National Guard, and then the unorganized militia, which is everyone else. And if you go to various state statutes, Virginia is an example of this, they break it down the same way. There's the organized militia, which is the National Guard and so-called naval militia, and the Virginia Defense Force, which is a subsidiary of the National Guard authorized by Congress. And then there's everyone else who falls into the unorganized militia. Well, by constitutional hypothesis, there can be no such thing as an unorganized militia. If you look at the history of the colonies, the independent states, and the statute that Congress passed in 1792, the first Militia Act, they organized everyone, Mm -hmm. literally everyone, unless you were a slave, because, of course, they had slavery in those days, and the slaves couldn't be allowed to have firearms. Hang hang on right there, Dr. Vieira. We're going to be coming right back, and we're going to talk about why this isn't just an academic argument. We're going to talk about the real-world implications of the militia and whether or not we have one. So stay tuned. We've got a long segment coming up with Dr. Edwin Vieira. Because there's a war on for your mind. That has been our motto here at InfoWars for my 18 years of battle against the globalist. And now we see the open announcements of global, private, corporate, tyranny over our governments. That's what the New World Order is. It's an unaccountable private combine of organized crime engaged in corporate takeovers of nation states and the conscious attempt to abolish basic rights and fundamental liberties. Infowars.com is not just leading the charge against this here in the U.S. or North America. We are leading the charge worldwide. And that's because our listeners, our viewers, our supporters, fellow freedom lovers like you across the planet resonate with our message of liberty and telling it like it is. And that's why for the last two years especially, I have thrown everything I've got, my time, my energy, our backup capital, everything into really trying to awaken the sleeping giant that is humanity. And that's why the July issue that just came in a few days ago is so important. We've already sold about half the stock we have of it at cost in groups of 10 up to 100 in bulk. It covers the entire NSA spy grid, how it ties in worldwide, how it's not about stopping terrorists, but about suppressing and dominating and controlling the free press and political opposition. And in this magazine, we don't just have three free bumper stickers like I did a few months ago. We have 10 bumper stickers, four full-size ones with amazing messages guaranteed to get people thinking like America has been occupied by globalist forces, InfoWars.com. Listen to Alex Jones at InfoWars.com. InfoWars.com, forbidden information. Listen to Alex Jones, InfoWars.com. And then on top of it, six medium-sized bumper stickers with the message as well. These are key to post in legal and lawful areas on your book bag, your computer, your car, or to give friends and family. I have printed 500,000 of these bumper stickers. Only half of this month's run of magazines has them. So when you purchase them in bulk or you're a 12-month subscriber, you will get the special issue. And I can't afford to do this every month, so it's going to be quite a while 
until we do this again. Please take advantage of this. Buy them in bulk and give them to your friends and family and encourage them to get these bumper stickers out because with 500,000 stickers, we can reach tens of millions of people with the message of truth. They want to collectivize us. They want to bankrupt us. They want to drive us into their arms to control us. They want to dumb us down. But the sleeping giant that is for humanity is awakening. So I want to thank you all for your support. I want to encourage everybody to go to InfoWarsStore.com and to get a 12-month subscription or to give a gift subscription. Imagine 12 of these coming to your friends or family's door to wake them up. Or to give a gift subscription to the local police department or your local congressman or woman. This is how we're going to affect change, voting with our dollars and voting with our time. Again, visit InfoWarsStore.com today to subscribe, to get the magazine in bulk, or to give a gift subscription, or to give yourself a subscription to wake up friends and family. I am all in. I am committed 110% to not mince words and to not back off and to boldly confront the globalist. And our listeners and supporters, our info warriors, who aren't behind us, they're right beside us. So I want to thank all of you that have supported us in the past, and I want to encourage all of you out there who may be on the fence, that know this information is true, but have been scared to take action. You had better be scared of not taking action and letting this monstrous system come to fruition. Now is the time to commit. Now is the time to say which side of history you're on. Now is the time to stand against the globalist and the new world order. And regardless of whether you get this July issue, this July 4th resistance to tyrants issue, spread the word about liberty, resist corruption in your area. Millions of us doing little things can move mountains together. I'm Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars.com and the InfoWars team. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. We're talking to Dr. Edwin Vieira about the real constitutional militia and about his book, The Sword and Sovereignty, that's available on Amazon.com. As one person put it, it's a magnum opus about the constitutional militia. Before we get back to Dr. Vieira, though, I just want to mention there is some breaking news about a coup apparently taking place right now in Egypt. The uh, Egyptian Islamicist leader Morsi, which was, who was supported by uh, Obama, it appears that the majority of people there are not happy with it. There's massive demonstrations in the streets, as you see right there. Lots of signs that we talked about at the beginning of the program. People very upset with him, very upset with Obama uh, putting him in power. And uh, they are now, uh, it looks as though there is a military coup that is underway. That's being reported by the Christian Science Monitor, as well as the... Um, uh, let's see, this is uh, a newspaper out of uh, New Zealand. So, so we've got several different newspapers that are reporting this. We have the um, Egyptian president, Mohamed Mirzi's national security advisor, said that a military coup was underway today. So there it is from the president himself saying that uh, he's getting kicked out by the military. So uh, we want to know how we keep a uh, essentially a slow coup from happening in this country because we're not talking about just the... Uh, academic issues of uh, correct understanding of the Constitution. You know, we talked about uh, some of the history of that with Dr. Vieira, but Dr. Vieira, talk to us about what's really at stake here if we don't have a constitutional militia, if instead we have a, an unconstitutional standing army. Well, the question in my mind, talking to any American patriot, is do you take the Constitution and Declaration of Independence seriously or don't you? These are not hortatory documents. They were written to provide a legal framework for running the government of a free society. And they are very much uh, like the engine, uh, I would say, of a Mercedes-Benz. They're relatively complicated, finely tuned instruments. And if you pull out the piston or you pull out a valve of a Mercedes-Benz, or especially if you pull out the crankshaft, which is absolutely necessary to transmit the power to the drivetrain, the system fails. All right? mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the Constitution of the United States, what does it tell you? What does it declare to you? is necessary to maintain a free state. This could not be more obvious. Thirteen words. You right. don't have to read my book. You don't have to go on the Internet and read all sorts of blogs. Thirteen words in the Constitution. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state, period. You could stop right there. That's right. Do we have such a well-regulated militia in any state in this country? No. No. And that is the result of what I would consider at least to be stupidity 
if not treachery, on the part of the people in Washington, D.C., and a lot of state uh, capitals, although those people in the state capitals pretty much went along with what Congress simply uh, laid out for them. And as a result of that, as a result of not having a well-regulated militia, which could perform all sorts of functions, conducting honest elections, providing alternative currencies, supervising public officials, I could go down a list, and in fact, I do go down a list in the sword and sovereignty and flesh this all out. As a result of not having these institutions in the 50 states, we now see the development of a national paramilitary police state that makes something like the Stasi look like a kindergarten. That's right. And we right. see continual foreign wars, too. That's another That's another problem symptom as well, it, right? right? Mm -hmm. A perpetual war for perpetual peace, as the old phrase had it. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we see that. And it's, it's no, co it's it no immediately coincidence. It's back to the point that. As the Constitution says, what is necessary for the security of a free state is a well-regulated militia. The militia are composed of the people. The people are the ones who ordained and established the Constitution. The people, the so-called good people, as the Declaration of Independence describes them, were the ones who gave the authority for the independence of the original 13 colonies, and thus today of the United States as a whole. This is the embodiment of the people's power, the militia. That's right. As Mao Zedong would say, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. And the Constitution tells us exactly the same thing. It, but it's not political power in the raw sense. It's political power in the sense of directed towards a free society. That's right. So you take that principle, whoever controls the gun controls political power. The Constitution tells you political power should be in the hands of the people, and therefore the people should control the guns through the militia. Do we have the militia? No. Ergo, we don't have the people in control, and therefore we don't have a free state. It's really very simple. So if you're an American patriot, and you're sitting back about asking the question the Ford Motor Company used to ask, what is job one? Job one is the revitalization of these institutions that the Constitution tells us are necessary. So how do you suggest we do that? Because you make a distinction between the private militia and the constitutionally regulated militia. Well, of course, there's no such thing as a private militia right. constitution. All mm -hmm. right? The militia were all governmental entities. Why? Because we're talking about popular sovereignty and popular self-government, ultimately. Right. These aren't institutions that are outside of government. These are institutions that within the government and control the government. And this has to be done state by state because you can forget Congress. That's a wasteland. All right? mm -hmm. And I wrote an earlier book, also on Amazon, Amazon called Constitutional Homeland Security which goes into this practical political question of exactly how do you need to organize people at the local level, grassroots level, in order to bring uh, influence, shall we call it, uh, on state legislatures to pass the appropriate kind of statute. Mm -hmm. And I think this could be done in some states, certainly, maybe not Massachusetts or Connecticut or New York, California, whatever, the wasteland. Right. But in some states in this country, it could be done. And my view would be, or my suspicion would be, that once that happened in one or two states, it would catch on very, very quickly because people would now realize, hey, there is something we can actually do here. There is a way we can regain control, at least of our state governments. And I'm looking at a situation, I tell people all the time, how many people recognize the fragility of the banking and monetary system of this country and are predicting a catastrophic collapse? And not just of this country, but perhaps banks throughout the entire world. Mm -hmm. When that happens, what kind of social dislocations, economic problems, civil dis unrest and civil disobedience will occur? Well, you can imagine that, right? That's right. It comes yeah, out of one of be, these disaster movies. That it's going to be massive. Out of Hollywood. That's right. And we do not have prepared in this country at the local and state level anything that is capable of dealing with that problem, let alone fending it off to begin with. We're going to depend upon institutions like FEMA, which <laughs> demonstrated their incompetence in Katrina, in Hurricane Sandy, again and again and again. That's what Congress has given us, this top-down, pyramidal structure, the all-seeing eye at the apex, right, which is utterly incompetent to deal with the kinds of problems we're facing. Well, we got FEMA. We just had the uh, story break yesterday on Infowars.com. Paul Joseph Watson found a uh, document where they were celebrating the fact that they were going to be using Russians to provide protection security at uh, mass events in the United States. So that's the kind of mindset of FEMA. We certainly don't want to rely on 
FEMA for protection <laughs> when uh, things collapse economically. And, and we have seen in some states, like in Utah there, and others, there's been some effort to try to uh, do something to uh, about gold, you know, because they're, they're concerned about a financial collapse. But we haven't seen anything done in any of the states that I'm aware of in terms of moving towards a constitutional state militia. No, they're terrified of the M word, the Southern Poverty Law Center. That's right. They've demonized and, and, and that. Them about this. And, and, and we're not talking about, you know, a, a private militia, because uh, as you mentioned in your discussions, you know, with the private militia, you've got Joe Bob and his friends over here, and you've got Billy Bob and his friends over there. Who's really in control here? There's not really any clear lines of authority. That's why it needs to be under a state government. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And the, the point I make to many people is the breakdown of the monetary and banking system could occur tomorrow morning. I mean, there's essentially no way that we can predict exactly when that will happen. And once that happens, things will get out of control very quickly. So step one should be the revitalization of the militia and the sword and sovereignty. I gave a very detailed uh, description of how once that is done, the militia could be used to start introducing alternative sound currencies into various states in anticipation of this breakdown of the fiat money system. That's right. Right. So one thing follows from the other, but you first you have to have the insurance policy of the militia in place. You have to have people organized, understanding what their legal authority is, understanding what their responsibility is politically, in terms of self-government. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. can be done. I, and we don't need to mobilize the full population of this country. I would think that if you started off with five or ten percent of the adult male population, you would have more than enough to perform all of the functions, at least initially, that would be required of a modern militia. So it's not as if one would have to derange the entire social structure to uh, you know, resurrect these institutions. It could be done on what would essentially be a voluntary basis initially, because I think 5% of the population would probably be willing to come out uh, sufficiently patriotic to be willing to come out and perform these uh, functions initially. And then once that happens, other people, through peer pressure alone, will look at the necessity practically speaking, of social standing and so forth, to participate. And then the thing has a life of its own, and it will spread and, and develop uh, to something I would think that looks a lot like modern Switzerland. Right, right. And uh, along the lines of Switzerland, think about the fact, uh, we mentioned that one of the failings that happens to a state, one of the ways that a state fails, is with constant foreign wars. Switzerland has always had a citizen militia there, and as a result, citizen, uh, Switzerland is famous for not being involved in foreign wars. They're famous for their neutrality, because if you have a militia, you don't get involved in foreign wars. Uh, particularly given that in World War I and World War II, they were right in the center of the conflict. That's right. They wrote it out, and nobody attacked them. <laughs> uh, uh, Hitler was not about to attack Switzerland. They were too well defended, too well fortified, so they would go all around them, but not into Switzerland. Oh, that, that's exactly right. Now, uh, obviously, the United States is not quite in the same position as, as Switzerland, but removing our involvement in one of these foreign adventures after another would be step one in returning us to a proper republic in this country, as opposed to something that uh, mimics the imperial Rome. That's right. That's right. So all these things play to, play out together, and especially we don't want a situation to occur where there is an economic or some other kind of catastrophic situation, crisis that develops. And because of the inability of the clowns in FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security, the armed forces have to step in with some kind of martial law declaration because they're the only ones capable of restoring order. We don't want that for a number of reasons. First, I think because the, con the Constitution precludes that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. we can't have the armed forces setting themselves up above the Constitution. The armed forces are really incompetent to perform most of these domestic functions. But number three, historically, one learns that once the armed forces step in on, in a situation of that kind, they never really step out again. That's right. That's right. right. That's and the entry point. That's right. And so you always have the possibility, even though they may be behind the, be behind the scenes and it's some kind of civilian uh, government that they put up front, that there's going to be another putsch or there's going to be another coup or another golpe, as they say in the you know, banana republics of South America, uh, because they always recognize, oh, we had to do this once. We may have to do it again. And then, of course, there are always people that will arise in any armed forces who have personal agendas. Yeah, liberties, advance themselves. liberties lost are never easily regained, and we That's have right. people chomping at the bit to uh, establish a police state. I mean, just look at the reaction to the Boston bombing, for example. 
the entire city on lockdown to try to find one 19-year-old. Dragging people out of their homes at gunpoint uh, is absolutely insane reactions to that. And we see this whenever there's a natural disaster. We see the difference in the way FEMA reacts. And, and my son did a video on this, won a contest. And looking at the difference between disaster uh, that was localized, we had a tornado come in and, and wipe out a small town, but it's re it was not widespread enough that the federal government and FEMA did not get involved. And so what you had there was you had a cooperation between private sources who were bringing in food, dropping them at churches, they were distributing it. You had the police there keeping people away from down power lines and everything recovered very well versus when you had a major hurricane that hit a large area, FEMA got involved. And all of a sudden, nobody could get food. They couldn't get relief because FEMA became this giant bottleneck. And they're going around shoving people around, you know, just just raw display of power. Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly right. And, of course, if a militia structure was set up in any particular state, there would be no, how shall I put it, existential need for FEMA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? People seem to say, well, we don't need you. We're capable of doing all of this. Exactly. Above and beyond anything that you could supply. The thing that worries me, though... You, you talk about what happened in Boston Watertown with the deployment of one right. of 9,000 uh, uh, yeah. Ramadans out there, 9,000 yeah. of these uh, Gestapo types. You didn't see any of those people who homes were invaded simply saying no. Right. I'm not talking about physically resisting, mm -hmm. right? but mm -hmm. simply saying no. When one of these armed thugs comes to the house and says, well, we're going to come in and look at it. No, you're not. You have a warrant? Right. No, you're not. End of discussion. Now, they still may have been arrested and dragged out of their homes, as many of them were with their hands up in the air as if they were prisoners of war. Right. But it was just interesting to me that in the cradle of liberty, Boston, Massachusetts, people have gone so far down the road of accepting Gestapo-like tyranny that they simply say nothing. That's right. You know, we had um, Charlotte Isserby yesterday that we interviewed on the Nightly News. She was talking about the issue of education. And she had a quote from C.S. Lewis, and he said, when training loses to, when education loses out to training, it's the end of civilization. What we have happening with the media, with the government, is really training. You know, you're trying to educate people about what's really in the Constitution. We're trying to educate them about what's going on and what's in the Constitution. But the mainstream media, as well as the government, is involved in a training exercise, just like we see this uh, giant plane flying between the skyscrapers here in Austin. It's all part of training. And it's, and it's training at a very low level. It's dog training. Yes, and yes. It's stimulus response. Yeah, it's like the, the TSA. It's a te technique that when you get a certain signal from your master, mm -hmm. you respond in a certain way without thinking about it. Absolutely. Look at the TSA. It's a perfect example of Skinnerian uh, positive operant conditioning, you know, where they come in and it's like, uh, you let me put your hand, my hands on you and uh, you can fly. You know, that's your reward, your immediate reward. It's kind of what you would do if you were a horse whisperer or a dog whisperer. I guess these are travel whisperers, right? They're, they're training us like uh, some brute animals, and that's basically what B.F. Skinner was talking about doing. Uh, that's right. And the non-animal says, as I do, I don't fly. Right. 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 Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, the airlines can go bankrupt. Yes. And maybe they should. Yes. Because they're playing along with this in the same way that many of these Internet uh, service providers and Skype and so forth and so on, we discover, are playing along with the, uh, the NSA mm -hmm. and turning over uh, you know, electronic communications. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's just what amazes me, that the attitude of people, that they are willing to accept all of this basically nonsensical police state activity, because they've never proven that any of this police state activity really has a beneficial effect. Oh, they've they proven that it... Accept this. They've proven that it isn't ineffective as far as safety goes. You know, they've had uh, the Florida congressman who was instrumental in putting it in actually saw the results, wanted to make it public, but they wouldn't let him because it was too damning. <laughs> we'll be right yeah, back with uh, one right. final segment here with Dr. Edwin Vieira, so stay tuned. Our viewers have demanded it, so now you're going to get it. Pro Second Amendment gun shows in the month of June. What we've learned is you cannot hide behind an I beam when there's a 50 cal present. Brothers in Arms, 50 cal ammo review, and more. 
coming in the month of June to the InfoWar. And it really comes back down to what we were just talking about in the last segment, and that is training. Training versus education. And we've got a perfect example of that today. We've got the U.S. government trying to train us to be a f afraid of everything, to run to them for their promised safety. But we also are trying to educate people with Dr. Edwin Vieira talking about what a constitutional militia is, trying to educate people about our real protection against tyranny. Dr. Vieira, thank you for joining us. And we've got one last segment here. I'd like for you to kind of summarize for people why this is important and what if anything, they can do to try to make this uh, happen. Of course, it has to happen at the uh, state legislative area, but, but talk about that. Uh, just one last segment, whatever you want to do to wrap this up here. Well, it's important because if people want to live in the free state for which the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were written, they have to follow essentially the instructions that are given in the, in the manual. Mm -hmm. uh, Well-regulated militia should be necessary to security free state. And we see the results of not following those instructions with the development of this national paramilitary police state, which no one can deny is there and is growing every day in its intrusiveness and power. Very rapidly, yes. Right, very rapidly. Uh, so if you want to stop that, or at least put a break on it to a certain extent, then we have to follow the Constitution's own instructions, revitalize the militia. The militia of the several states are state institutions, constitutionally, that has to be done state by state. It has to be done by the people themselves starting at the grassroots because they can't expect the state legislatures won't necessarily pick up on their own. And as I said earlier, I've written a book called Constitutional Homeland Security. It's on Amazon that describes the practical approach to this problem, or at least the suggestion that I have. And then the larger book, The Sword and Sovereignty, which goes into excruciating detail. Mm -hmm. And I think it essentially is undeniable, the results, because it derives from history that no one can question. And it's all there, footnoted with endnotes and so forth and so on, for those people who really want to get into that in and, detail. And it's very important because, as you mentioned before, you know, uh, the federal government is really a lost cause. Everybody wants to focus on changing the president, you know, from this Republican to this Democrat or vice versa, or changing the Congress. It is so hopelessly corrupted. The only chance that we have, and it is still an uphill chance, is at the state level. We've had a situation right here in Texas where a couple of years ago we had a bill introduced to stop the TSA conditioning us to be slaves so that we, they put their hands mm -hmm. on us and molesting people. And they were basically intimidated by the federal government into backing down, saying that they were not going to let planes fly. And the same federal government that's flying planes between buildings today here in Austin. So there's a lot to be done there. People need to get involved. As Alex says all the time, you are the resistance. And we're going to have some overdrive coming up here with Alex. We're going to be talking about this uh, plane issue here. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Vieira. And that's uh, that you, book David. is The Sword and the Sovereignty on Amazon.com. Stay tuned. We're going to have overdrive with Alex. Now you can watch the InfoWars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show.